Welcome to Ask Psych Sessions with Marianne Lloyd, where we ask some of the best teachers we know questions from you, our audience. If you have a question or an idea for a conversation, please visit bit.ly backslash ask psych sessions. That's B-I-T dot L-Y backslash ask psych sessions. All one word, all lowercase. And here's our next question. Thanks so much for joining us today. Our guest is Dr. Roxanne Donovan from Kennesaw State University. Thanks for coming in today, Roxanne. Happy to be here. Before we jump in, if you could tell the listeners a little bit about who you are, if you want to give some context about your uh, research, about Kennesaw State, if people aren't familiar, or anything else you think that would be helpful. Sure. Let me start a little bit with my positionality so people get an understanding of where I am on sociodemographic variables. I was born in Guyana, which is on the northern tip of South America, but has culture that is more similar to the Caribbean. So if I get angry, you'll notice my accent will come out. (laughs) We immigrated to New York City, my family and me, when I was eight. So I grew up in New York. I am multiracial, um, multiple generations of multiracial, um, which is typical of Guyanese culture and other Caribbean cultures. So I am black, white, and South Asian, which caused all kinds of confusion when I came to the States, because in the Caribbean, at least when I was there, nationality trumps everything. So I'm waiting for the teacher to say Guyanese. It's not happening. (laughs) You know, they're doing a census back in the day was raise your hand if you are like, raise your hand if you're black. Oh, okay. I raise my hand. Raise your hand if you're white. Oh, okay. And then they're like, um, Roxanne, you got to choose one because multiracial wasn't an option. And I remember going home to my dad and like, dad, there, there's no Guyanese. What should I choose? And he gave me a quick lesson in hypo descent. So, um, All that is to say that I identify most clearly as Black, as the labeling has changed. It's been a dynamic space for me. It's uh, Black seems incomplete given um, my multiracial background. I am partnered. I've been married for, oh God, a long time. I can't remember (laughs) the amount time right now. I have two children. They're teens now, so send me a lot of positive energy as I try to survive this space. Um, I am cis, uh, identified, and by way of positionality, um, class-wise, we were economically vulnerable growing up after we moved to the States. Um, Obviously, right now, Given that I'm a professor, I'm in middle class uh, status at this moment, and obviously I have education privilege. So that's a little bit about me. I'm sure I've forgotten something. I always forget something. So I apologize in advance if I've left out some of my identity. Um, I am a professor of psychology jointly appointed in the Department of Psychological Sciences and the Interdisciplinary Studies Department at Kennesaw State University. On the interdisciplinary studies side, I teach gender and women's studies and black studies. Actually, I teach courses at the intersection of those. That's the thing that fires me up the most. So black women's health, for example, black feminisms, the black woman. I also teach psych of gender, theories of personality and careers in psychology. Those are some of the courses. And just as context, Kennesaw State University is a pretty large university here, um, part of the university system of Georgia. I think at last count, we have almost 43 thousand students, so pretty large. Um, I think recently we tipped over to students of color being the majority, slightly, I want to say at about 52%. Um, And we've grown significantly in the years that I've been there, in the over decade that I've been there. So a lot of this growth has been um, recent in nature and the growing pains that go along with that. We're an R2 university, about 10% of our students are graduate students. Um, Oh, God, now I forgot what else you asked me. (laughs) Oh, my research. Um, My research looks at how race 
intersectional variables, structural variables like racism and sexism impact the mental health of people of color, particularly black women. So I look at how stereotypes and racism and sexism influence uh, people of color, particularly black women. And particularly, I look at the stereotype of the strong black woman, how when that's internalized, how that degrades mental health. And of late, I've been writing books. I shifted a little bit. So I'm writing books on social justice teaching, social justice learning, and social justice parenting. So that's been quite a journey. Book writing is hard. So all my book writers out there, much, much respect for you all. Well, thank you so much. There is We could do a whole series and pick every one of those and and talk about teaching. Uh, But that's not even why I asked you to come on. So maybe I'll ask you to come back. Um, I asked you to come today because you gave the closing keynote at CTOP a few weeks ago about, um, for my cognitive side, I would call it well-being. You might have uh, other, other terms you like to use. And so it's been a couple years of pretty intense, um, stress and strain, which per your research has been um, even stronger in uh, some intersectional and marginalized identities. So I was hoping that you could tell our listeners that may have been really prioritizing their classrooms and not themselves, um, some things that we should be thinking about and working on. um, And if some people even feel like they might need permission to do that stuff, some reasons why uh, it really matters. And I'll let you kind of take it however you want to take it. That's a, first of all, I'm so glad you're focusing on this because I think faculty care is not something that is talked about enough in higher ed. And the question that you asked, what can faculty do to care for themselves, I think is a tough one, right? Because higher ed is an extremely stressful place. There's there's this myth that you know, faculty sit around <laughs> thinking and mulling things over and, and that we have a lot of space, but research actually suggests the opposite, that we are extremely stressed as a profession. Um, those of us in the profession are highly stressed, similar to K through 12 teachers, similar to emergency room doctors. And I don't think that we actually hold that sense that it is a stressful profession consistently. You know, when we're in struggle, Uh, at least from the clients that I work with, one of the things I didn't say in my intro is that I'm also founder of Well Academic, which is a professional development organization for faculty, helping them work well and be well in the academy. And one of the things I find consistently amongst the clients that I work with is when they're in struggle, they think it's an individual thing. They do not attend to the fact that if there is one truism in higher ed is that there is always, always more work than time. So I think the absolute first thing that I would say is to give yourself some grace and some self-compassion if you're in struggle, because it is a very kind of universal experience among most faculty that it is stressful and That's number one. But stopping the busyness to experience one's stress, (laughs) that sounds harsh, right? Why would anyone want to experience stress in their bodies and acknowledge it? Well, first of all, you can't address it unless you know it's happening. And I'm just going to like give a little snippet into all of the ways stress can show up and all of the ways stress is showing up for folks right now, right? Because our our physiology isn't set up to deal with this type of chronic, chronic stress. So some of the things many people know as stress, like fatigue, digestive challenges, muscle pain, hypertension, headaches, irritability, depression, feeling overwhelmed. I mean, I think I'm naming things that people will know, but let me kind of cue into some of the things that people don't necessarily attribute to stress. Impaired judgment difficulty learning, 
forgetfulness. Have you ever been in the shower and you're like, did I just condition my hair? I don't even remember. And it happened six seconds ago. Or you walk into a room and you forget why you're there. This consistent worrying, indecisiveness, insomnia and hypersomnia, impulsivity, numbness, not feeling anything, and isolation, kind of wanting to just turtle up. All of those are consequences of stress and more, right? I'm just giving you a snippet. And so there's this sense when we're in this place of struggle that there must be something wrong with me. Everyone else is doing so well. And especially if you're on social media, this highly curated space, you're looking at everyone's living their best life while you're in struggle. And so there is this way to internalize it as there's something wrong with me and I'm just not handling the moment well. So I want to start at the very foundation that if you are in struggle, you are not alone, right? No matter what it seems like on social media. Um, And so kind of sitting with what might be going on, where your capabilities are, can be a challenge. You kind of have to create space for that conversation with yourself. And because higher ed is a place of such stress, so many of us don't have enough breathing room to even consider our own emotional and physical state. And so my invitation, right, is to maybe start by sitting with how you're feeling, giving yourself some space and some stillness to connect with, am I feeling stressed? Where in my body might this be showing up? Why am I crying all the time (laughs) at, at commercials? Or I feel frustrated or or angry, or the things that used to bring me joy, I'm now feeling resentment over. All of those are kind of the ways that um, stress may show up for faculty, like just feeling like everything is an obligation. And sitting with that at the very, very core, like rooting yourself down into your own experience, allows you to do a very important thing, assess your capabilities. Because those of us in higher ed, we have super high expectations for ourselves. Other people have super high expectations for us. But when our expectations don't match our actual capabilities, when that gap is wide, there is so many things that can fill that gap that can be problematic, right? There's blame, shame, actually, that you're not showing up in the way that you want to, um, anxiety, depression, stress, like who needs to add more stress (laughs) to this moment? But when we are not kind of accounting for our capabilities, our expectations can remain high. And again, that gap is wide. So the goal is to close the gap. So how do you close the gap? You begin by really getting very, very concrete about what your capabilities are. And only if we slow down, can we start to kind of account for the fact that we may be tired, we may be lonely, we may be sad, we may be scared, we may be overwhelmed, or you may be feeling nothing, right? Just numb to it all. And all of those things are okay, right? But we need to understand our starting point before we can even have a conversation about what kind of interventions do you bring in. So that might be not what you wanted me to say, Maria. Maybe you wanted some quick tips, but, but I'm starting right in a, in a place of mindfulness, right? I'm inviting mindfulness. What is your experience at this moment? I actually think that that's a great place to start, right? Because the band-aids, you don't even know where to put them, right? If you just gave me some band-aids and I'm fixing something that's not there. So um, for those of us that I think haven't practiced in that, one thing I took up in the pandemic was going to mindfulness class. And it has been really eye-opening to realize like how much I just have gone around living in my head when it comes to to work, right? Not for other things, right? Like I, you know, I like to run slowly. So obviously I tune into my body for that, but not when it comes to work. And one thing you asked us to do was pick our one 
thing that was so important to us this semester. And I still haven't come up with an answer. We're on spring break. So that's one of my things on my list to like tune into who I am. So for those people that haven't practiced slowing down and sitting down, do you have some suggestions for like what's, this doesn't sound like something you can do in five minutes, right? In between your two classes. What are some, um, what are some, how do you get started tips if you have not done this work and you have just been plowing through, making sure nobody fires you? You know, grinding it out in busyness is a numbing practice, right? If you're head down all the time, you're not fully experiencing typically your, the breath of your full humanity, all the emotions that can come up because you're just grinding it out. So sometimes, so this is my caveat, sometimes when you slow down enough to connect, the feelings that come up initially can be fairly unpleasant. So if you try this and you're flooded, all of a sudden you're sad, all of a sudden you're overwhelmed, I would invite you to take it super, super slow right? And you don't have to do it all in one sitting. Take whatever breaks that you need, extend it over time. One of the ways that um, is helpful as a very beginning grounding practice is just naming where you're feeling your stress in your body. So let's not talk about emotions <laughs> or go that route. Um, in the beginning, a, a core mindfulness practice is, okay, where am I feeling stressed right now? Because many of us have our favorite spots for stress. It lands in certain places. For me, you know, I have twin things on my shoulders and they, they begin to ache and hurt. And so if I slow down enough, I might actually be like, oh, they're hurting now. I'm so not in my body that I wasn't quite sure that I was in pain, right? It was, I wasn't being mindful to it. Some people feel it in their stomach. Some people feel it in like their jaw because they're clenching, right? And they don't realize it. Um, some people may notice that they're making fist, right? So as a just as a beginning point, right? Where am I noticing? Where am I feeling these challenges, these stress, these all these things that are coming at me, these stressors, all these things that are coming at me. And then just sit with that. Um, noticing is the first step to mindfulness, right? And maybe even journaling about it, um, especially if you're feeling, as they say in the South, some kind of way about, <laughs> about experiencing your physical state. Um, journaling it will help kind of get any negative emotions out onto the paper, which can minimize the experience. Now, mindfulness isn't about minimizing negative emotions. It's just adjusting your relationship um, with any challenging emotions that might come up for you. So that could be a first step. Naming what comes up for you also creates just a little bit of distance so that you can exhale, right? Oh, I feel sad right now. Oh, I feel, wow, there's rage coming up right now. I'm really angry at, at what's happening in the world, at what's happening in my life. I'm feeling very anxious. Whatever it's, whatever's coming up, right? Noticing, naming is the very beginning practice and also normalizing. Common humanity, that's such a part of um, a self-compassion practice to realize sometimes what comes up for people are, oh, I did this misstep, I yelled at my kid, I didn't show up in the way that I wanted to, my students are in need, I'm not giving them what they need. And so all this um, negative self-blame talk. So holding with the fact that we are imperfect, messy beings, that's like a part of being human, right? And so if you're not showing up in the way that you want to, it's because you're human. Right? It's just, it is, you have reached the bounds of your own humanity. You have given, you have nothing else to give. So noticing, naming, normalizing. And then the final thing is meeting whatever comes up with lots of self-compassion and self-compassion, the aspects of self-compassion, right? Or mindfulness, common humanity. And the final thing is kindness. So to say to yourself, you know, 
this is hard for me right now. This feels bad right now. Um, and I'm okay, right? I can take care of myself. I can give myself love in this moment. And that's a counter to typically how we have relationships with ourselves. We can say some of the most horrible things to ourselves in our own minds um, that we would never say to a dear friend. Thank you for those pieces. And I think that um, centering the idea of like kindness and common humanity and I'm mindfulness, you said were the three pieces of self-compassion. Mindfulness, kindness, common humanity. And I think those are you know, probably things some of us have to train on because that certainly was not part of my graduate PhD work. Um, those, I think probably we all have to train on it because the dominant culture does not center any of these things. And so if you think about the, if you think of culture as this current we're all in, taking us to a particular direction, some of us don't even know we're in a current, um, but we are. And higher ed is is its own milieu, it's cultural milieu. Um, there's a dominant culture in higher ed. And I promise you that current is taking us straight to overwhelm and overload. And so there's this way that if you're going to practice, if you seek to engender a wellness practice, if you seek to be well in the academy, you honestly have to l be mindful of that current and as I said in the C-top keynote, kind of turn around. <laughs> you have to face the opposite direction and start being intentional about swimming against it. And so the caveat for that is, you know, m my clients are always like, oh, I was doing well for a while and now I'm back to being overwhelmed and overloaded. I suck. I can't be consistent. And my response is always like, it, it is a coming back. There is no destination you're ever going to reach where it's going to be easy because the current isn't taking us to ease. The current isn't taking us to wellness, even in this moment where all of us are clear that we are in burnout territory, right? The, you listen to the news, everyone's talking about burnout, but the current is still rapid. You know, we're in the rapids and it's taking us in this direction of burnout, overwhelm, and overload. So you will get caught in the current. It's not if, right? It is when. The goal, though, is to recognize earlier and earlier that you're in the current. Oh, current got me again. And try to bring self-compassion when you get caught, right? And then what are the steps that you take? What What's like the first little thing that you can do to start swimming against the current again? So it is always a coming back, a coming back to your values, a coming back to practices that hopefully you're trying to do on a regular basis. For example, for me, um, my sign that I'm caught in the current again is um, Netflixing. Like I'm not <laughs> sleeping. <laughs> I mean, I, I may teach this stuff, but I still get caught too. I mean, I'm in the current also. And so for me, it's like, okay, I got caught up in this is us again, and I'm not, <laughs> or some other random thing, um, random show that really is not as important as my sleep. And I'm going to bed later and later. And that's, that's my warning sign. And all of us have warning signs, the, the thing that goes first, right? And so when I'm in that place, how can I, A, bring myself some compassion? You're caught in the current. You're not a bad person. This is a hard moment. And I need to walk. Like, I know that if I'm caught in the current, the first thing I need to do is get outside and walk. And no, I'm not going to jump straight to doing my 10,000 steps. But if I just walk once around the neighborhood when the sun is shining, then that is my beginnings. That's my gentle way of getting back, right? And so I invite your listeners to think about, like, what is one small thing that I can do in to benefit my body or my mind or my spirit to help the begin get me to the beginnings of swimming against the current the beginnings right 
we don't go from being caught in the current to being able to swim like crazy in the opposite direction. It just, we have to start somewhere. And to be really gentle with ourselves about what that start is. Many of us, again, those high expectations. I'm going to go from, you know, not sleeping to sleeping 10 hours. Well, okay, maybe. (laughs) But maybe you think, how do I get 20 more minutes a night? How do I get into the bed 20 minutes earlier? And have that as your beginning point. That is a great, very practical way to move forward. Um, We are coming up on our sort of unofficial 30 minute time limit, but I always like to let guests have a few minutes. If there was something else they wanted to talk about, I come to you with topics, but is there anything you would want our listeners, which are primarily um, higher education psychology professors, but who knows who else they are? Is there anything else you would want to tell them about, whether it's about this or something altogether different? So I'm a little bit of a data geek. So I'm I'm just going to toss out some numbers because sometimes when I say you're not alone, (laughs) you know, psychologists, other social scientists are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's woo woo. (laughs) I'm not about the woo woo. So I'm going to talk about an APA stress survey that was taken, I want to say 2021. So late last year, 79% of the U.S. adults who responded to that survey said they could have used more emotional support than they received last year. So put a pin in that. The Chronicle of Higher Ed did a study in October 2020, or they published a study in October 2020, and I wonder what it would be like if they did it now. 43% of the tenure track professors who responded reported that they're seriously considering changing careers or leaving higher ed. 43%. 73% of tenured professors admitted to moving up their retirement date. If those data (laughs) don't show that we're in some sort of crisis point where we're feeling very alone and also overwhelmed, I don't know what is, right? And so I want your listeners to know in a tangible way that they are not alone. And that's the good and the bad news, right? The good news is you're not alone. The bad news is we're all in this crap show together. Um, And I want you to know there are things you can do to help regulate um, your emotional state so that you can better cope with what is in front of you, right? And one of them is social support. I know many of you know that social support is super important, but social support is the healing balm for this moment. And so that's the good news. The bad news, again, is that we're still in a pandemic where the numbers are going down at the time of this recording, but we're still in the pandemic. So what can you do to reach out to someone else Um, whether it be a therapist, whether it be a friend, whether it be a family member, to just be in connection. And it doesn't have to be, what the data shows, doesn't have to be some deep, amazing, like mind-blowing connection. It could just be casual conversation. Um, And that helps. And so is there a way that you can make more regular, add more regular connection into your life? Like I'm meeting my high school bestie, who was also my college roommate, we're meeting the third Wednesday of every month um, just to see each other. She moved back to the state that I'm living in. My partner and I have date night tonight. Um, and, And like where we are intentional about spending time together, my family just put in brunch and bond. Now, I I mentioned that I had teenagers, so this is not like an easy, loving, flowing thing. But on Sundays, we have, we make a delicious brunch. I say we, it's really my partner. He's the chef in the house. He makes a brunch. We sit down together and then we do a family activity. Lately, it's been walking uh, on this uh, trail that we have close to our house. But something that you bring intention to that is about connection, that's a very concrete, tangible way that you can help manage this moment. And you are not alone. Wonderful. Thank you so much, 
I've been talking with Dr. Roxanne Donovan from Kennesaw State University. Thanks for listening. Listeners, did today's episode make you realize you have a question you would like someone to answer? I would be happy to take it into consideration and find a guest that can help. But what I need you to do is head over to our Google form at bit.ly slash ask psych sessions. Thank you.